I mean, sure, this could just be part of the intro. You know how we do it organic. Hella black. Hella new African. You know what I'm saying? We, we in this thing, man. We got my boy Q with us. If you ain't know, now you know. You know what I'm saying? Tapping with all the episodes we've had him on with before. You know, it's a it's our brother right here. You know, so we got a, a good episode in store. Make sure y'all go to our SoundCloud, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Patreon.com slash HellBlackPod. You feel me? If you got a dollar to spare to support uh, New African Media, you know, tap in with that dollar. If you got $5, tap in with that 5 You got 20 You got 25 you know, support the real. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Patreon.com slash HellBlackPod. But we got a good good episode in store for, for all our listeners. I feel like every time we all, all three of us link up, some heat is produced. Some heat is produced. And we ain't just theorizing either. Q has, as if you listen to the previous episodes, as someone who's been on the ground with us uh, multiple times, this is someone who's come and helped develop our cadres. And so, yeah, this is, as much as we theorize, uh, we also put boost to the ground. Boost to the ground. That's the ultimate goal. Nation building, nigga, because we <laughs> yeah. need a nation. <laughs> we need a nation. We already is a nation, so we got to free the nation from these Euro Americans, man. Right? Without question, how you doing, brother? Man, really, uh, all praise is due to Allah, man, at the end of the day. Yeah, this is what it is, man. I've just been maintaining, still studying, still striving, bro, still struggling out here, but I'm making it, bro. And every day is just another day to get better, and I'm definitely blessed to be here with my brothers. So, yeah. Allahu Akbar, my brother. Absolutely. We were saying before we got on, you know, it is – our goal on this podcast, on this episode specifically, uh, to do right by the martyr uh, Tupac Shakur, right? Uh, there's been a lot of propaganda, reductionist, lies. nasty work being spread on the good brother's name. Uh, and so what we're going to do is give some objective facts, but also speak to uh, the very positive impact, impact he's had on us as individuals, but also uh, the new African independence movement, because something that gets erased or reduced is the fact that Tupac Shakur wasn't in fact an organizer in every sense of the word, whether you're talking about um, him being the vice president or the, was it the vice president or the chair? Vice president. The chairman of the New African chair- Panthers. Yeah, chairman of the New African Panthers, right? Or also what he was doing to organize uh, gangs across the so-called United States. Like, bro really had his boots on the ground and, and did real work. Uh, and for some, not for some reason, for all the reasons they tend to leave those facts mm-hmm. out about Especially him. they try to divorce his, uh, him being a new African. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Especially a conscious new African. It's like, you know, the the quote-unquote Marxist-Leninists or the, the communists. And like, oh, he he was a car-carrying holder. Well, I mean, where was his work being done? Or how was his work being done? What was his practice? Man, he, Pac was a new African. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we're we, we going to – it is our attempt – to spread the truths about Tupac, uh, to give a holistic look at at his life and his contributions that he has made to the new African independence movement, to the uh, communal, egalitarian, uh, revolutionary humanist uh, conditions of new Africans. That's what we gonna try to do on this pod. Uh, And so I really wanted to start with asking what does Tupac mean to to y'all as as individuals? Uh, What influence has he had on y'all as new African men? Uh, navigating, you know, this expanded plantation here in, in 2023. We can start with you, Q. Man, what does Tupac represent? Um, Tupac represents to me, if we're talking from every facet, from musical to economic game to the cultural game, everything that he exemplifies, I, the one thing is just the voice, a voice a real voice of clarity, a voice where no matter what he was speaking on, the ability to tap into the new African spirit, the spirit of our people, the ability to relay and articulate our actual way to navigate this condition as being subjugated people, as being colonized people, as being internally colonized people, as being uh, identified as black males in this society, racialized as black people in this society, the ability for us to group up together, the ability for us to create art that is long lasting, the ability for us to speak on the wrongs, to do wrong, to learn from doing wrong. He was a living example and a living voice 
of you know, kind of in the same way of how they spoke on Malcolm X being our living black manhood, quote unquote. I feel as though Tupac follows in that lineage of being our living black manhood and our example for the 90s. And I, I always couch Pac as being the last example within mainstream media that has a direct connection to the new African movement the African independence movement more uh, articulate um, and also just the black power movement as a whole. He's the last living testament that we have because beyond them, you can't really name me a celebrity who has that direct lineage, that direct line. And that's why Afini Shakur called him the black prince of the revolution, because I think she knew what she was gearing him up to be. And I think all of us feel that as we uh, progress through these years, we realize how much we've lost with just that living example no longer being here. Yeah, I think there's two people who are the most impactful to the youth and to the nation that are martyrs. I would say it's El Haj Malik El Shabazz and then Tupac Shakur. I think you go to any <laughs> new African locale and you're going to see a photo of Malcolm. <laughs> you might hear a speech playing, and you're going to hear Tupac. You go anywhere across the world, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you go see someone wearing a Tupac shirt. You know what I'm saying? You might hear someone playing a Malcolm speech. You know, uh, two different generations, and, of course, Pac being inspired by, by El Haj Malik El Shabazz, right? Uh, but when I think about Pac, I think about a, someone who was strategizing. I think someone who was also a, a product of the new African nation. You know what I'm saying? Matulu, Afini, Asada, you know what I'm saying? Mumba, like a product of the new African nation. And it just shows you how strong, like if you have a strong tribe, you have a strong family, you have that root as your foundation, you know, especially coming from the Shakur household, like that example that he said was what, what he was taught. You know what I'm saying? So, I think it gives a great example of the of the family dynamic. You know, I think the left sometimes they don't want to talk about family and the importance of building a family and having having that uh, household. You know what I'm saying? Um, but he was also a strategist, a tactician. You know what I'm saying? The way he was uh, making music, but then pulling up in different uh, different neighborhoods. With the program. You know what I'm saying? Hey, let's let's get together, man. All right, we're gonna make this music, and then we're gonna have a program. We're going to do something for the kids. We're going to do something for the youth. We're going to do something for the people. And he was a master of language. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he was a master of language and a master of being able to control the media, I would say, too. Right? Because he put on what some would say, oh, man, he was faking. It's like, no, he was doing certain things for a very strategic reason so that the masses of people could resonate with his spirit and resonate with his music and be able to make positive change. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So I think that that tactical strategy and then just uh, the spirit you get from his music. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that you feel in your soul when you hear Pac's music. And they just, even in the gym today, it's going on. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to start, you know, riding the bike a little bit faster, you know? So I say the tactics, the strategy, and then the impact that he's had is uh, a very long lasting. Um, Pac and Malcolm are two of the people that is up there for me. Without you know, question, some people might take a uh, problem with, with those statements, but I I mean, for one, <laughs> we speak in subjectively. I asked y'all individually, okay. but I believe that y'all subjectives, uh, y'all subjective opinions are based on objective facts. Yeah. <laughs> Feel me? like you go you go places outside of this country and you see t statues of Pac. You see people wearing that bandana. You see people with the tats across the stomach. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it really made me think of, like, especially like you was talking the, the martyrdom part, right? Like, like in Islam, martyrs don't die. Like, they're still with us. And you think about the, the spirit of Malcolm still being with us within our organizing work. You know what I'm saying? You could say also, like, the way we approach uh, how we work with artists is also, like, the spirit of Pac still. Oh, without question. You know what question. I'm saying? So, like, through, like, the work, the material programs of building the nation, man, they still with us. I'm speaking about them right now. You know what I'm saying? So, that's also the, uh, the martyrdom is, is a lesson for us as well you know what i'm saying of Absolutely. not having fear um of this you, you know capitalist imperialist white supremacist uh zionist ran world you know what i'm saying they didn't fear it mm -hmm. they didn't fear it like they knew what they was up against and they Absolutely. still chose to take that path so uh, that's that's a lesson for me pop represent Absolutely. uh like calculated courage 
a lot of people try to act like uh, it was sporadic, and that's I, I know he was a, definitely a victim of a, a psychological warfare in every sense of the word. Uh, but he was very calculated and courageous. This is someone who, uh, as they might say, understood the dialectic, and it shows in the way that he organized. It shows in the way that he moved uh, through the world, and so he. When I listen to Pac, I can tell it's like when I'm trying to get something up out of me. I'm trying to dig deep. You feel me? I was listening to, and we're going to talk about these songs later for sure, but I was listening to Ambitions as a writer, what those lyrics do to me, uh, realizing how young he was. Like, we watching someone who was 24, 25 years old, and now I'm 31, about to be 31, and I'm using his, uh, his words as uh, a guidance for my day-to-day -day life. Come on, man. That's that's speaking to the power. That's that's speaking to the power of of uh, timeless. Yeah, without question. Timeless and the conditions are still, you know, obviously they've they changed. Mm -hmm. Arguably, you could say they got worse, but you feel me? What he's spending is still something you could party your day to day life. <laughs> it makes it still reality. Very rarely do you see an artist that has a street named after them in the Middle East somewhere in. You know what I'm saying? Afghanistan, you got a statue in Germany, you got child soldiers listening to your music in Africa. You know what I mean? You got, you know, gang members listening to, you know what I mean? Street tribes listening to your shit in LA. You have all across the world the colonized people, the spirit of the colonized world un understands Pac. They understand Malcolm. They understand our martyrs. They understand that they were an organizing force because they were able to fold us all into a coherent body politic of recognizing that we are residents of this country, but we ain't citizens. And yet we built this mug, but we don't get none of the benefits mm -hmm. for him to say all this. And for Malcolm to organize the way that he did, like I say, it's a cultural arm of revolution that is sometimes the most potent. And I feel like Pac represented that he was like a very spiritual, like when he talks about his music being spiritual, that's the influence from Islam. That's the influence from revolutionary Christians around him. So for him to be martyred in this way for us, it doesn't surprise me at all when you have 12-year-olds talking about, I, I want to make music like Pac. And you got 30-year-olds that are like, oh, I want to you know, live my life in this way. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because when you live for the people, when you do for the people, when you're willing to die for the people, you are with the people forever. So... I feel like Pac is definitely like that spiritual arm for us, man, that cultural arm of revolution. Bro, you had the uh, the former Iranian president, uh, Mahmoud, he said he was quoting Tupac, like in on Twitter. Like, he would say, it's time to fight back. That's what Huey said, two shots in the dark, now Huey's dead. Like, you got presidents of nations <laughs> quoting Tupac Shakur. Come on. Like, that's, <laughs> come on, bro. Like, that's why the government has done everything and anything to prevent the rise of anyone, <laughs> of anyone like Tupac Shakur to wrap it again. U.S. government and, of course, mm -hmm. the, the wretched Israelis. The Zionists. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Pac said he didn't have a record until he made a record. Until his uh, his music video for Trapped. But Also, to go back to your point of his age, for people to not un understand that Pac from 91 to 96, we're talking about really a five-year span. And one of those years was in jail, Clinton Correctional, to my Rikers Island, you know what I mean? So for one year to be in jail, if I think it was for eight months, people don't un understand the gravity of the situation. You have Poetic Justice in 93, you got Juice in 92, you got uh, Tupacalypse Now in 91, if I'm not mistaken, y'all. And then you got Machiavelli and All Eyes on Me in 96. The man died September 13th. He got out of jail, I believe, in November of 95. So we're talking about from November till September, not even a year. We're talking about six million records sold in six months out of jail. The biggest rapper in the world is Afeni Shakur's son, has ties to Geronimo Pratt, <laughs> has ties to Asada Shakur. And people want to tell me that this is not a targeted assassination and removal, not just of Pac, but of the community politic that is at the center of everything he's talking about. For people who say Pac lost his way towards the end of his life, we can get more into that. But if you, even if you listen to Machiavelli and the unreleased records that were not put on albums uh, or remastered, remixed, he still kept his politic. He still shouted out Matulu, still shouted out Geronimo, Sekou. still shouted out all of his members. Yeah, Sekou, like, you know what I mean? And 
Sekou's son was in the Outlaws. So, Yaki Gaddafi as well. So He was assassinated as well. Exactly. Not a, don't, Only a couple months after um, the a Vegas cover-up, in my personal opinion, we can get more into that, Yaki was uh, killed in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a complete removal of the only eyewitness who says that Orlando Anderson did not shoot not him. That was not him. Vegas. That was not him. I seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then also there's about a page and a half in the LAPD and the Vegas documents. There's only about a page and a half of police misconduct that was recorded in Vegas. People who moved evidence, people who let people go through barricades that should have been checked people who identified vehicles that were allegedly with around the shooting didn't question anybody didn't get names numbers coroner reports botching reports the hospital conduct letting people in and out of his floor without getting checked for id for all we know two box court could have been alive in that hospital alive and well but somebody could have did something else to him to you know to ease the transition along so for all we know everything is on the table because how does the but once again, how does the biggest rapper in the world selling six million records, movies on the way, soundtracks on the way, about to start his own production company? How does the biggest rapper on the face of the planet die in one of the most heavily populated surveilled streets in America, so-called America, and yet we have no record of it? We have we have video of the president getting popped in the 60s, but no one has any footage, any traffic lights. No traffic camera footage of the biggest rapper on the face of the planet getting pop. It don't make sense at all. And Shug just miraculously unscathed. Didn't know where to go. You just know? drove the other way. All right. You know, even though even though Shug Knight, uh, record, uh, according to John Patash and all the FBI documents that we've exhumed, uh, Shug Knight played football for UNLV, so he knows exactly where the hospital is. I don't really care how rattled you are. You know, you know not to drive in the opposite way. You know not to drive. Uh, maybe you don't know to go directly exactly. there, panicking. But you know exactly. not to drive the opposite direction. Exactly, and we're talking about 1996 in Vegas. So we're saying things like this are very common knowledge to people who understood the information, but people don't know that you know Pac had blown up on Shug on, on the phone asking him for his money. Where's my money? Where's where's my royalties? from death row i'm about to get out of here and he's screaming on the phone even in the dear mama documentary which i, I know we're going to talk about that mess but in the even in, in the dear mama documentary uh tupac's sister says that a couple of days before they went to vegas they were court ordered to go to vegas because Pac had charges they said if you, if you do a benefit concert at club 66 dudes i'll let it go the charges that he was on for like gun possession or something so he goes to vegas after telling Suge and whatnot, after I do this shit, I'm out. After I do this concert, I want my money. I want everything. I'm leaving Death Row. And that's what all of his intimate family members say, from the aunt to the sister. But the only people who say he wasn't leaving is people like Reggie Wright, who are LAPD, who was the head of Death Row security, who told all the other bodyguards to turn weapons, their uh, walkie-talkies mm-hmm. off and to leave their weapons in the hotel mm-hmm. room. Big Frank who's also transitioned, is also uh, passed. Peace be upon all the people who passed in this whole case. It's really just, like, uh, appalling how how many deaths are re- linked to people who have intimate information about Pac. Um, the only people who seem to be left are those who are his enemies or people he dissed or people who were, you know, had things to dis- say disparaging about him. But even people like Michael Moore, who are FBI, I believe he's deceased, who said that he told Pac, I'm working for the FBI and I'm supposed to surveil you. And he's no longer here. So everybody who has said exactly what's going on in Vegas, who had intimate knowledge, no. we I don't mean, know. That's just the markings of an intelligence operation. So you're talking about all these people. Exactly. After this assassination happened, and all these other people were just killed randomly. Mm-hmm. Come on, it's the signature of the CIA. Signature of the FBI. They're covering up every track possible. We don't have to have conspiracies. Also, Look how many agents were actually involved. The, <laughs> like we don't it, have it to. Ain't no conspiracy when the objective yeah. facts in the literally the paperwork shows this. They mm-hmm. put the paperwork in Bible history. Russell then, you have an analysis with you putting all the steps together. It's clear as day. It's clear as day. Absolutely. 
the one thing that I always say about federal conspiracy is a sure sign of federal conspiracy is when there's too many narratives. When there's too many narratives, when there's deceased witnesses for key parts of information, you have a federal conspiracy that has, has a likelihood. When you have somebody of high reputation, of high political importance, who is just miraculously disappeared or miraculously assassinated out of nowhere, and no one has a clear narrative. Everyone will say, oh, no, Pac was staying with death row. No, Pac was leaving death row. Oh, no, I mean, Pac how did he, how did he even sign blood with death row? death row? He did what I'm saying. <laughs> Interscope would not put up the money. Suge was the only one who would put up the money for him to leave out of, out of Clinton Correctional. And Pac told his uh, lawyer at the time, who was in the New African Independence Movement with Tiny Ty Hemba, he told him, this is my only chance to get out of here. If I get out of here, I can. Make, it's my only shot. I know I can get some money up. We can do this. We can do the community centers. We can get the money back to the people. We can do this. I, but I can't do it from inside. And even on the inside, he had converted uh, Latin Kings members and, and the Latin Kings members uh, began to adopt the Code of Thug Life that he uh, he drew up with, Matulu Shakur. And the Code of Thug Life was everything from we need to stop dealing at these hours, we need to stop dealing in our neighborhoods, near, near playgrounds, no shooting near playgrounds, we don't attack, assault, rape our women, we don't do these things, like just trying to be a code of ethics. And for Pac to instill this in Latin Kings members who were high ranking, they then called their homies in the streets in New York City, and they... Uh, converted hundreds of members to stop dealing. And this is actually documented within people uh, who are academics in New York at the time about what happened to the Latin Kings uh, dealing on these blocks. Now they went from, you know, dealing there to, you know, dispersing and actually doing things for the community, having more events, uh, you know, cookouts, things like that. So we see Pac's influence even from inside the jail. He was organizing to outside, you know, prior to his prison stints, doing things like performing for APRP, African Liberation Day. Um, and it's actually a fact that until he got his first record deal, he was very close to giving up music to go and to be full time as a, the chairman of New African Panthers. It was miraculously um, a young Euro-American girl who was the daughter of an executive at the record label that uh, per, that um, distributed Tupacalypse Now. She heard his demo and said, we have to sign this guy, dad. This guy's great. And it was only because of that that we don't know Tupac as the chairman of New African Panthers. We know him as the biggest rap star. Hey, and that's a, a history they don't want to tell you. A history they don't want to show you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know they mentioned it briefly. In the, exactly. Uh, I don't even know if you want to call that a documentary. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mockumentary. It's a mockery. Is, you know. So that history, it's there. <laughs> Because we need to be media literate as new Africans, as revolutionaries, as would be revolutionaries, as organizers. You need to always be media literate. You need to strive for clarity of what is this image I'm seeing, who produces it, who's funding it, who is the target audience, why are they showing me this now, what is this supposed to be in conversation with, what is this supposed to induce in my emotional state. Is this supposed to attach to me psychologically? Am I supposed to carry this into the real world and replicate this behavior? Is that what they want me to do? Media literacy is about that, identifying the image and the actual subtext. So the terrain of counterinsurgency that we have been inundated within this country, you see that everything about Tupac has to just relegate him to being either the misguided, you know, young Panther who fell into gang life, or they call him just a thug madman who met his own demise because he couldn't control his own anger. And no one sees the legacy of the, you know, quote unquote, anti-blackness of that. The more so the specificity of it is uh, anti-black male of we can't control our emotions, we're animalistic, we're looking to pounce on anybody who disrespects us. When no one talks about the fact that Tupac even jumped on Orlando Anderson is because the beef that they were having with Puffy, who all indications of the East Coast, West Coast beef being a central intelligence concoction um, and, a, and a media concoction. And even Afeni was able to identify that for Pac and say, look, we need to rectify this. All evidence points to Orlando Anderson and that jumping being in uh, more so retaliatory of like, you're coming from my life. There was bounties on death row chains, but
but the rumor behind behind the um, behind the curtain is it was bounties on death row artist life. So Pac as just the homie that he was, the loyal man that he was, the I, I have to attack all threats head on. He met a threat and you know dealt with his, dealt with his issue like a man. It wasn't until everyone else jumped on him that it looked like, oh wait, gang violence. That is a federal tactic called entrapment. Why is Orlando Anderson in the middle of the MGM? No one talks about that. No one ever questions how does he just sit right there waiting for Tupac to come at him. You're this big, bad, quote-unquote, gang member, like they always say in, in the TV. Just notice, once again, the media literacy side. How are they framing this? Gang member punched by rapper and then retaliation. That's the entrapment part. Whereas no one frames it from the perspective of death row chains have a bounty on them, potentially death row artists like Tupac have a bounty on them from Bad Boy Camp and the people who Puffy hires in Compton, the Crips that Puffy hired in Compton to go after the bloods that Suge had on his payroll. They don't look at it as entrapment of using the cover of, of gang warfare to execute the Panther son. No one looks at it from that perspective because the terrain of counterinsurgency has to keep our minds on, only stuck on the images of, oh, well, Pac had thug life. And, you know, Pac, you know what I'm saying? He spat, he spat at the cameras and, oh, the sexual assault case where all of his other conspirators got off scot-free. But he did one to four years potentially for groping a woman's butt against her will, even though all um, all of the indications and in all the police reports show that this woman and no judgment, uh, performed a sexual act on him on the dance floor in public. So that's where you illegally grope a woman's butt and go to jail for that. But the men who actually did the sexual assaulting get off scot-free, and they get severance mm -hmm. in that case. And the police officers who were present when you got shot were the police officers. The arresting officers. The, the lawyer was who? <laughs> If a lawyer for Haitian Jack was a police you know I mean? lawyer, you feel me? You know who? You know she had a background in the military. This don't fit the narratives, though. And um, it's just for me, I feel as though that the reason why they don't talk about this history for Pac is because it gives a direct line to show where we lost, in my opinion, all control of hip hop as a cultural arm. In my opinion. I believe that there are traditions that African people within this country uh, do have within our own uh, lexicon. We have, you know, beat making, we have, you know, drums, we have the spoken word, we have the word, the word is very powerful for us. But when you try to say that hip hop post, I would say 2000 is anything of an independent culture, a legitimate culture, that's where media literacy just shows to me that it can't be. Because where do we have the ability to create our own institutions? Where is the ability for us to create our own institutions within this music and use this music to, to deliver tangibles, qualitative things to our people, quantitative things to our people, beds, housing, plumbing, food, water, shelter, clothing. If it was possible, if hip hop started in the park in the Bronx, how come the Bronx don't look like Wakanda? You know what I mean? But but yet, in the end of the day, we sit around and I think delude ourselves with a level of perceived sovereignty and perceived control that I just don't see present since 96. And in the 90s and before, I, I would argue that from its inception, hip hop has always been uh, incubated within Zionist hands, personally, I, I would say that. But there's still a level of wrestle for power. There's still a vacuum of power that I think the 90s represented. And there was not the complete uh, overturn of things like the Telecommunications Act of 94, where they consolidated all these media companies down to just six. And how Time Warner by the 90s had purchased all the labels in America, damn near, v like v v the uh, Vivendi uh, from France, owning Sony, the Japanese coming in and getting all these these colonial puppets and these colonizers coming in to dominate what was already, I would say, a byproduct of European colonization. I, I just can't at this at this at this stage of my life, I can't give hip hop the culture word 
because I think that culture has to be for our people. I think that each tradition in each region of the so-called United States has a specialized way of formatting these traditions to our condition. But in terms of us having this body politic of, oh, hip hop, I don't see that because we don't deliver tangibles across the board that we all agree on to our people using these cultures. Where are the labels that pull up to the Bronx, like I say, and hand out food every week? You're producing billions of dollars for European corporations. You are a European corporation, but that within itself shows that they will never pull up to the neighborhoods where these where these geniuses where these African literary geniuses, these orators are organizing their people or relaying the news to what's happening in their section. They're not going to let you, you know, turn the tangible side to the, it has to just be the minstrel side. We'll, we'll let you dance for us. We'll let you sing for us. We'll let you, you know, tell us your pain and your stories about how you, how you had to bury loved ones. But ultimately where is the power base? Where's the economics Where's the tangibles that come from us saying that we have a hip hop culture? And I believe the death of Tupac Shakur is the death knell in that argument, personally. Because if we weren't able to protect the one who's like, we need to, you know, get all the rappers together and deliver tangibles, look at what we have now. It's just a bunch of, to me, sentient billboards for corporations. Everyone's wants to, you know, give an advertisement in their raps. Everything is an Audemars, it's a Patek, it's baguettes in the, you know what I mean, it's stars in the ceiling, it's all these things that are meant to put these parasites of the mind into the youth of us, into the minds of our children, and, and it's steering us towards a consumerist mentality. They they want militant consumers. They don't they don't want militant producers. And I feel like that's what Tupac also represents to me is he was a militant producer of thought, militant producer of the seeds of a culture and the militant producer of actual ideology for people to follow. I, I blame the cadres for the state of things, period. It's if you look at Tupac being a byproduct of the Black Panther Party, uh, of the BLA, of the New African Panthers, there was a, a vanguard element helping shape helping shape him right and so any any problems any contradictions that we see that exist in the new african community it is the uh role of the cadre to course correct and to resolve that contradiction and it's a it's a it's a result of cadres not being uh cemented in these communities yeah. that's why the zionists are able to take hold of them yeah that's why uh i was on this panel and i said they said what is the two biggest factors you know what i'm saying i said hey we are up against neocolonialism. Like, who do we blame? I said, okay, it's neocolonialism. We interest ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, yeah, we got to blame our right, neocolonialism, but it's ourselves because we haven't done anything to change it. George Jackson says, stop letting the enemy raise your babies. We haven't Period. made the sacrifices needed. We haven't had the developed the high levels of organization. You feel me? We haven't developed the cadre to where our right, we is shifting and where we could actually have culture, <laughs> actually have control. Because what is culture if you have no control? What is culture if you have no land? What is culture if you have no housing? What is culture if you have no water? What is culture if you have no dignity as a human being? What is it? And who's deciding what culture actually is since we always use this word? And when you follow the money, <laughs> like you say, be media with it, you follow the money, all right? Who's making it all? <laughs> these Euro, European, transnational corporations and these Zionists. And they're telling us, all right, what to think. They're telling us what to listen to. You feel me? Like the algorithm of the Spotify playlist, man. Do you even know what music you like? Or was it the quote unquote, the culture <laughs> tell you? Or was it actually the algorithm telling you? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, yeah. it's not to approach it from a from a purity, right? Because I work in music and a, a lot of the things that we have produced are a byproduct of uh this capitalist, individualist, a reactionary humanist uh, society, right? But it's also constantly trying to get into the ear of the artists I work with. Like, bro, we got to do something for the community. Like, we 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 got to do something uh, as a means to hopefully uh, get them to see what this is actually all about, right? Like, okay, yeah. as you throw in these shows now, what can you do to actually give something to these pe to these people? What what can we actually give to the people versus always trying to sell them some? But I mean, as you being you, as you being in the cadre, oh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So that is, 
getting closer to – that is culture. You know what I'm saying? Because he actually is producing something. Like you were saying, right, it's uh, producing meals. It's producing money for the breakfast program. You know what I'm saying? It's giving those grocery boxes and turkey boxes on Thanksgiving. Like it's having an actual impact in the community. And hopefully you know using saying? that as a starting block to get them to decolonize their own mind. Like, bro, we got to stop talking about this. Like, why, why do you, you know, like why, what is the cause of all this pain? Like, why do you really want these things? Why do you want the chain? Why do you want the, the car? Where is this chain and car coming from? Uh, what led to you having to live this very reactionary, violent life. Like, I understand you don't, you're just res re responding to the conditions, but like, bro, we got to start thinking about what, what's going on. Like, we got to start being what Yaki says, urging people for everyone to be a critical thinker. Like, really start analyzing what's going on around us. Uh, and it's the cadre's role to, to step up in it mm -hmm. and, and to provide that structure and that analysis. That's why I always appreciate um, from uh, Fred Hampton Jr. when he was like, organization needed Tupac and Tupac needed organization. And that's the reason why I always believe in if not everything the European does in terms of warfare, do we need to meet with an equal force, but there's certain things just within strategy that if your enemy has it and you don't have it, you're not having a fair fight. So we think about the terrain of counterinsurgency, Hollywood. Uh, we think about the music industry, how it operates in New York, LA. Um, what I believe is, the only way for us to combat the propaganda sphere is we also have to have what they have. And that's, they have assets, people who are knowing and not knowing unconscious and conscious of their role to organization, to organize power, to soft power. Whereas people look at a, like a Jay-Z sitting with an Obama, the unconscious African looks at that and says, Oh, that's power for us. Even though you can't tell me who us is. It's power for this black community where we don't commune with each other, where we don't vote as a block, where we don't say we need this for this region. We need this for this region. The South black nation needs this. The Western black nation needs this. And they correspond and we cooperate. We don't have that. But yet people will see and a representative of an African with an imperialist stooge and say, that's power for us. Whereas in my opinion, my hypothesis is, as an Nkrumah Shakuras, I believe we need assets within the media sphere. We need people who are aware and unaware that their role is delivering tangibles for a people. It's all about a need to know basis. Some people not going to be down with the mission and that's fine. But some people are down for just immutable facts of life that children do need food. Can you do that for us? Bet. Can you cut, cut, can you cut that check for 25K? We need that. Some people are willing to be more need to know basis where, yo, I'm, I represent people's programs. I'm rocking with people's programs. I, I, I rap all across the United States. I get bags and I give back. You're an asset. That's the way that the CIA operates. That's the way the FBI operates from the activist uh, field to the acting field, to the sports industrial complex all over. And we are the only ones, in, in my opinion, those who are conscious Africans, we're the only ones who are not equipped with, a media literacy mindset to say we also have to have the Tupacs around us. We also have to have the folks who are willing to say, you know what, bro, I was going to buy this chain, but like this going to feed like 300 kids. This going to feed a whole encampment of people. We need new tents. All right, bro, I'm not going to pay my, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to pay for this new car. I'm not going to buy the Airbnb for the next two months. Cause I was trying to chill after tour. I'm going to just give it to the people. And it's sometimes that needs to know basis of, Hey bro, you know what I mean? Big mama need to pay her bills, bro. Can you help out? Sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it's, it's as sophisticated as a POC strategy of, I'm going to get all the rappers together in a van. We're going to go across all the hoods to all the drug deal dealer spots. And we're going to say, like, bro, we need you to not serve from this hour to this hour. Just let, let, just let the kids have it. Then we're going to get sports teams. We're going to have a community spirit where we're going to have the fathers and going to have the nation. We're going to have all these different groups come in, the, the Christian churches. If y'all want to all be a, 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 about the spirit of Malcolm and Martin, let's come together and let's actually do something for our community. And then let's actually, you know, build out free concerts for the people so we can all have, have something to do every weekend. No alcohol, no drugs. We're just going to do it clean. We're going to do it sober for the people. And we're not going to cuss on stage. It's like these ideas are revolutionary because that's culture. That's how you democratically build a response 
to normalize your survival. But when people try to tell me that, oh, hip hop culture is, you know, we just get a mic and we just rap. Like, no, bro, that's a tradition. That's not a culture. You're doing the tradition. You're engaging in a tradition. Africans been rapping. Ask the Somalis. You know what I mean? Africans been doing poetry. Ask the Somalis. Like, ask these Africans where we migrate from to become West Africans. If you understand African mm-hmm. history, that's where, what, 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 man, drums? We, what I mean, we've been doing. Why, uh, we- we had drums. Uh, and we had Hashim work. on an episode. We was talking about Pac. He said, "Man, you either a griot or you a jester, mm-hmm. and we need more griots. <laughs> we know more griot because that's the African talking. tradition. You know what I'm saying? Rap didn't just was just born in New York. <laughs> you know what I mean? We Different mutations from our African superstructure, brother. It's the African superstructure. And, and where we are, depending on our regions and our locales, all we're doing is responding to our condition using the knowledge of, of that superstructure. It's embedded in our cultural memory. It's embedded in our cultural DNA. The understanding of we have to make food for the entire village to survive. We have to eat what we kill, use every part of the animal. We have to create stories and folklore to understand our reality. We have to submit ourselves to a higher power depending on where you are. If some people refer to Islam, some people refer to the Orthodox Christianity of the East, some people refer to, you know, the more traditional African spiritual systems, whatever it is, don't matter if you are praying to an altar or if you want to have a prayer mat or if you're praying in the pews. And honestly, Judaism is ours too, as Kwame Ture tells us. It's the incubator of what is known as Afrabia gives us all of this culture. So for us to understand this, of course, Tupac follows in that line of griots who speaks to the condition of the village. They speak to the condition of the, of what the tribe is going through. And for people to try to demean his memory, demean his legacy by leaving him out of top five, they leave him out of top 10 conversations, they leave him out of rap conversations. And they'll talk about Jay-Z being a billionaire. That if you're media literate, you know that that is either a reaction to propaganda or a person is propagandizing. Yeah. No, that's a fact. Uh, so, so what does uh, Tupac <laughs> mean to the New African Independence Movement, uh, and why is he one of the greatest organizers to ever live? For me, he's a blueprint, especially as someone who is uh, grew up with a young mother. You feel me? Grew up on welfare, Section Eight, uh, is navigating, living, still living in a town, and trying to build the Revolutionary Kaja organization and trying to actually be centered in like that real nation tribe shit. Uh, he, he's the blueprint of it. Uh, especially as I feel like I've really grown into stepping into manhood, like, you know, 30 now, about to be 31 next month. It's just changed the way I try to engage with my family. You see it, like we just haven't, we always got family over here. Uh, and so I think it's the very small tribal things that Pac did all the way to the very grandiose gestures of trying to uh, galvanize the folks around him with a platform and capital to be centered in the community. Like yesterday with our with our community pop-up market, that was all for the people, by the people. We didn't have a single corporate sponsor. Now that's not to say I wouldn't reject corporate dollars if we can get them, right? Because that would have led to more programming. Yeah. Uh right. But hey, I think from the small, from the small of way the way he he uh engaged with family, right? Like Pac was known for buying these cribs and having hella people living with him. Like he was essentially recreating Panther houses. <laughs> That's how the Panthers organized you. Once you became a full-time Panther, y'all st- we all stayed together. The real communal shit, right? Uh, and then I think about what he was able to do, what Q was referring to earlier, where uh, trying to start this league, right? Uh, but then bringing in, like, Sonika Shakur, who folks need to get familiar with, you know, formerly known as Monster Cody, and, like, bro, I need you to play a big role in this and understanding the role that the, the ghetto is going to play, the ghetto masses is going to play in the ultimate liberation of the people. Uh and then just always keeping boots on the ground, bro. Just really staying tapped in with the community. That's not that's not normal. And it's not what they this one of the reasons why he, you know, led to his assassination, essentially, right? Like he was still very much tapped in with what uh, Malcolm will call the grassroots. And so I think from the everyday way that he lived his life, with being courageous, with being constantly rooted in his people, showing up for his people from the very small gestures of letting his family come live with him. Uh shit. Busting at pigs when they was assaulting assaulting a fellow new African, and then so much in music or just in any form of entertainment or any 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 element where people are having success, they always use that as a means as to why they can't actually organize 
right? Like not so much be a don't like Pac was also a donor with money, but he actually organized, bro. You talking about a platinum, one of the biggest artists in the world still organizing, like community organizing. And every, we about to do this league. We got these youth centers. We about to get this money from going on this tour. I'm speaking out at conferences. Bro, he was a grassroots organizer while simultaneously being the biggest artist in the world at a time where now people- Biggest stars in the world. Come on. <laughs> he a blueprint. He a blueprint. Yeah, man, people don't talk about, like, I resonate with y'all, brothers, because I see a lot of the spirit of, like, Oakland and Pac as well. We also need to speak about, like, Pac being incubated in Oakland, like, not only just his voice as a hip-hop artist, but his politics stem from Oakland. If we understand the Black Panther Party and where it originates as, I call it all the New West Africans, personally, and I feel like you know, dealing with, you know what I mean, dealing with the new West African, you know, ide- ideology that, you know, this pantherism and whatnot, Pac was able to get a little bit of that urgency that Oakland instills in you, in my opinion. Like, I have a, you know, I have a lot of people I correspond with, a lot of orgs I correspond with, a lot of orgs I've done PE work with on the side, shadow working with and whatnot, but P- People's Programs is the only one that I've been able, blessed enough to actually be on the forefront with and being invited out to actually do on the ground work with myself and the urgency that I see within the boss, the Lindsay and the people that work in Oakland period, the working class of Oakland, it's the urgency that's instilled within Pac's form of how he raps. It's the urgency of how he lived the, you know, the understanding of being in Marin city, being in Oakland. Um, You know, he talked about how in some of his last interviews uh, with Angie Martinez, like, you know, I, I love Oakland with my whole heart. Like he used to have an apartment right outside of Lake Merritt, right, right outside. That's where he actually did the interview with Angie Martinez. If you go back and look at the lost interview, and he talks about it, hip hop needs to be about more money for the people. It needs to be, be about be about different beats. It needs to be about you know what I'm saying community spirit. Like every time I I go platinum, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna get a big check. That's out of his mouth, verbatim. Every time I go by them, somebody's getting a big check. And I see the urgency of how y'all brothers move, and I see the urgency of Pac going from a movie set to the studio to record six songs, then going back to the movie set to finish his his lines, and then going to do a, a, you know, a press conference with Snoop about fighting the three strikes law in L.A., then going hopping out in you know, Nickerson Garden Projects to go talk to some Bloods or some Crips that took somebody's chain and said, yo, brother, we want to be stealing from each other. Can we at least do this and that? Matter of fact, I pay y'all to do this and that. Let's all sit down together, organizing actual truces amongst gang leaders, amongst tribal leaders. And this is the urgency. So in my opinion, it also dispels more of that counter terrain, uh, that counter insurgency to the terrain that he was involved in and we're involved in now and we're subjected to, because how do you have all this time to be a gang banger and involved in so much violence if you're an actor in the studio organizing truces, going to do club appearances, doing shows to get money up, fighting court cases. Where's all this time to be, you know, in the street impersonating, you know, gang members? Like, that's the narrative that they want you to think. So how can a man as busy as that, we see that you brothers barely have time to do this, but by the grace of God, y'all find a way with your urgency. So they want you to deny logic. That's what colonialism is. It's the capturing of land of time reality the the distortion of logic the replacement of actual immutable facts of life immutable sciences the replacement of that with mythology fantasy fantastical sensational versus the sober the calculated the pragmatic the urgent that's what to me Pac represents to the new African movement is we have to be all of these things. There ain't no excuse. My, hey, if you want to make that movie, go make it. But hey, you got to be on the block this time. You know what I mean? Like, hey, if you want to make that album, make that album. But like, yo, you're going to have to go and do this free concert for these kids too. It was a sense of urgency and responsibility, you know, and I think that only comes from uh, him being from who he was from in terms of family, but also just believing in a higher power. And you hear that entrenched in his music, you know, it's like, nah, I got a responsibility. <laughs> I got a responsibility to the nation. I got a responsibility to the people and I got a responsibility to God. You know what I'm saying? So day in and day out, I was like, all right, yeah, I'm going to do this movie. I'm going to do this, this song, but yeah, I'm going to be in the community. I'm going to be running around, but I'm going to still mm-hmm. make a shake. 
You know, Pac wasn't talking about capacity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pac wasn't talking about self care. Mm-hmm. Pac was talking about community by any means necessary. By any and all means necessary. He was talking about community. He wasn't just talking about he was living it. Mm-hmm. From the way he lived day to day in his house with his family and partners to being on them stages with his people to then taking the money and then providing it to the people and then developing uh, uh, certain principles amongst gangs. What, what are we really talking about here? Bro was an organizer. What are we really talking about here? He was a revolutionary nationalist. He was a new African. He was a revolutionary organizer. And that's why they do everything and anything to spit on his legacy. When you take that approach of understanding that uh, everything he did was for a political purpose, then you should understand why he was dealt with by the state in a very political way. It's very simple. That's why they don't talk about him being an activist. And then you have these organizer. jesters who claim they, you know, for the people making podcasts and making media spit on Pac's legacy, trying to spit on Pac's legacy. Like, what type of buffoonery is that? Under the guise of pan Africanism. Under the guise of black power? <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Straight up, nigga. Criminal. <laughs> Man. Nasty yeah, work. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. No. <laughs> and that nigga know too. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because people would rather, and I want also want to speak to this, is that although, you know what I mean, the urgency and the lessons that we learn from Pac, uh, the mistakes, the mistakes, the messing up, the Those human aspect lessons bro. for people. It's the to human understand. aspect. So even like we talk about it in this way, yeah, we we understand his humanity. And we learn from his humanity. Exactly. Be- exactly. Inshallah, everyone does as well. Un- understand that what Pac said, I'm not a role model, I'm a real model. That's that encapsulates the entire thing. It's like, look, I may mess up. I may, you know what I'm saying, hit hit my head on the door, but next time I'm gonna make sure I, I duck. And it's like for him to understand this and to put this into the self esteem of our people, for him to speak on that, a Faini herself being an organizer of, you know, a master of law, self taught to defend herself in the Panther twenty one, to be raised by that, for her to lose her way and to battle addiction but come out of it, it shows the Shakur spirit and the self esteem self-esteem that is instilled within our children that we need to instill in the children around us and still in our brothers and sisters around us and it's yo you may make a mistake you may have to do that bid but i promise you yasmin fula and afeni were there and that's the community that you need to do that's the community that you need to do for in my opinion and i feel like that's what Pac represents as well is like for every single mistake there was a lesson that we can learn not just as human beings individually but within organization of you need to know how to spot these agents, these agents like, you know, Haitian Jack in New York City, who will give you everything. They'll introduce you to Madonna. They'll put you on stages and they'll give you Versace robes and they'll give you the, you know, top floor in this penthouse. You can stay there. But hey, when we come, we bring in this girl around. And when we get there, now you in court and we gone. All, all the homies, all the guns that we have, we're putting them in your room. Now you're getting charges and you just going to take that because you have no other choice because you've been abandoned by so much of what is supposed to be our community that you're willing to take from the people who are giving you tangibles. And that's one immutable fact of organization is that the people are going to take their resources from who is offering, whether it is behind a paywall, whether it is behind the barrel of a gun, whether it is given to them freely, whether it's given to them in the handbasket, it don't matter. If whoever has the tangibles, I'm going to go get it. So if I got to sit in a workplace for eight hours and get my my tangibles for my physiological needs, my housing, clothing, shelter, all these things that the Panthers talk about, I'm going to do that. If it's going to come in my community, I'm going to do that. But it's the example. And that's why media is so powerful. It's an organizing force. It organizes the minds. It curates the minds. It curates temperament. It curates behavior. And that's what people don't want to see is the spiritual power. The, the psychological warfare aspect and for Pac to be an example in that terrain and be so powerful to have so much real estate within this terrain of counterinsurgency, they had to remove it. No more thug life, no more community mind, no, no more, you know, military minds like Pac talked about, no more against all odds, no more, no, no self-esteem for the people, no real positive manhood. No, no, no. We're, we're going to give you more money, more problems. We're going to give you all about the Benjamins. 
We're going to give you, you know, a pass to Kovacier. We're going to give you the onslaught for the next 10 years is going to be money, drugs. money, 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 cash, money, H-O-E. Yeah, just drugs. We want you high. And Pac was a victim of counterinsurgency as well at 24 and 25. People don't want to look at him as that as well, as a victim of counterinsurgency. Somebody who was given all the alcohol, all the Alizé, all the thug passion, all the weed that he needed to, on the plane from Clinton Correctional, when they got him, they gave him all of that stuff. They gave him all the alcohol, all the marijuana, all the drugs that he wanted. And when he got off the plane, he literally collapsed because he had never had that much and just in, in, induced in him at one time. He was exhausted from I mean, getting high and drunk. He, he was talking on about the himself plane trying to, to LA. Man, I'm tired of this anger. I'm, t- I'm tired of this yep. energy. Man, I need to put this bottle down. And it's one of his last, and that, uh, the interview he did in prison. He's talking about getting clean. And this has always been a, a, a tactic by the state. Always been a tactic. Right? The psychological warfare Absolutely. and then, you know, putting substances as a form of chemical warfare onto the people. To, you know, that's, that's what's happening. We've seen it from crack <laughs> to, it's, it's to alcohol. Sedation. You feel me? It, it's a sedation. reason. It's a reason that they was doing that to him. So, dear mama, the the, the, the documentary. I Man. like how we ain't really talked about it yet and we <laughs> really grounded in like some of the historical facts about Pac before even speaking on the documentary really. But I think it's important that niggas do uh, some course correction and setting the record straight um, about it. You know, I only watched maybe the first episode and then you came down, you like, don't watch the rest, bro. Just, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I try, I have mixed emotions just because uh you know, what people are gonna say is that his family put it out. How can you three niggas who never known him, who never met him, how can y'all speak on it when his family, his godfather, his mom, his cousins, his sister was all in his auntie was all involved? With the, who do y'all three niggas? And I'm just gonna say, this is my subjective opinion based on objective facts. This is how I reached my conclusion. Uh for one, if I go and y'all let a nigga who testify whose testimony led to me doing two weeks in prison, two weeks in jail direct a life story about me. I'm just wondering like, what is really going on here? A nigga who in my, one of my last days, I called him a coward. <laughs> no, that's, that's objectively in one of Pac's last phone calls and interviews with Sanyika. He says the Hughes brothers are cowards. I don't know if he went back and took those where it'd be maybe people again, maybe these folks know something I don't know. So I'm just going off again, my objective understanding called them hot cowards. Uh, I know that he did two weeks in jail for assault, for a fight with the Hughes brothers. I don't fuck with that. Feel me? A nigga sent me to jail. I called him a coward, and he's producing this film on me. That's my problem. Another is that the point that Q made, where all these counterinsurgent tactics that were used just do not come up. Why don't, if we're gonna talk about the case in Haitian Jack, it's mentioned that Jack was like bailed out or got out of, but like, it's like, we don't know why though. You do know why. It should be mentioned that Haitian Jack's lawyer was the lawyer that was on retainer for the NYPD. That is something that should be mentioned. If I'm trying to give y'all the story on Tupac Shakur and how he went to jail. And from the music, from Pac's own words, he a snitch, he a rat. So what are we talking about? It should also be Again, mentioned. If you a researcher and is looking at the paperwork, what's the paperwork say? <laughs> Why am I in Las Vegas? I had a court order. It was either go to Las Vegas or go to jail. I had a court order. I wasn't just going to the fight because I was trying to fuck around. I was. I had to go. I was ordered to Las Vegas. By the judge. These are very crucial facts. It should be mentioned that uh, I don't... In the, I stopped watching with like 30 minutes left in episode four. I stopped watching. It's four episodes. I stopped watching. I'm like, I just cannot stomach any more of this. And so that's where I stopped. But I don't know if it's mentioned that uh, was it Legs who worked for the uh, who, which one of Afini's boyfriends worked worked with the feds that got her hooked on dope and shit. I think it was. Could have been Legs. That was been mentioned. Legs, yeah. yeah, that's what Patara said in the book. Yeah, this is just a lot of. It's not mentioned how many people were working, how many LAPD, FBI were on death rows, payroll. 
like actual like worked. Mm-hmm. Like this. How many un- undercovers? Undercovers like Russell Pool. Uh, Russell Pool exposed in LAPD documents that like there were mad um, undercover police officers who were on duty at Death Row at Can Am Studios where Pac was recording, and they were only got put on payroll when he, when he got out. And Russell Poole went and asked them, why do we have all these un- undercover officers? And one officer said, oh, we're surveilling the, 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 the Shakur. They don't even talk about how in Vegas, the FBI documents revealed that they were on the scene in his caravan when he was being shot. And they did not no crime uh, go scene. after the no, supposed, no chase, you know, nothing. vehicle. No Come medical, on, man. you know. But we telling a story about this man's no. life and death. And these are things that we just omit. So you gotta ask yourself mm-hmm. why. <laughs> Absolutely. I watched the entire thing of Dear Mama. And they don't talk to you about how the Hughes brothers disrespected Pac because Pac wanted clarity on the role of Sharif within Menace to Society. Those are the directors of Menace to Society, the Hughes brothers. They directed that, in my opinion, a minstrel film about life in the hood where they just make these animalistic caricatures of old dog who just shoots a man for no reason because he disrespects his mama and, and keeps watching the videotape and it's very sadistic and it's very just reactionary. Um, and Pac was supposed to play a Muslim. He's supposed to play Sharif. And Sharif was written to be also a part of these crimes and things that they were doing within, uh, you know, the South Central neighborhood that they were, uh, you know, doing these uh, carjackings, and, you know, robberies and uh, sticking people up at gunpoint. And Pac was wondering when he was in reading for the role, he was like, uh, why as a Muslim would he be doing this? He, he wanted clarity on why is Sharif doing it as a Muslim? Why would he do this? Because Pac clearly had respect for Islam and raised within the tradition himself as, as a youth um, with Afeni and Yasmin Fula. Um, so of course he's going to have questions like, oh, if I want to be an authentic person, if I want to be an authentic character, I have to put myself in his shoes. I'm not going to think that that's a contradiction of Dean for me to be killing people as a Muslim. Like that doesn't make any sense. And the Hughes brothers disrespect Pac and say, stop, stop being a B-I-T-C-H. And Pac is like, hold up, man, you ain't going to disrespect me like, like this, man. We just talking about the role. And he kept in, interrupting because he's like, yo, this line don't make sense. Why would he do this? And they're like, yo, man, you either get out or you start acting like this. And Pac was like, you matter of fact, meet me outside. So then they get to squabbling and whatnot. And his friends jump in after he gets the one-on-one. But the narrative is that Tupac got his friends to jump on Allen Hughes because Allen Hughes was scared and that's the counterinsurgent narrative. But everyone in the clique say, we weren't jumping on, bro. Pac wanted his fade head up one-on-one with dude. Dude was scared, ran behind his limo. His brother got in the limo and drove off, and Pac chased after him, and his homies was behind Pac. But they was just making sure that, you know, like all homies do, that he ain't going to try and try no BS with him. But the fight didn't happen one-on-one, so Pac just had to get his licks in real quick, and the rest of the homies did what they did. So then they call that a jumping. But media literacy reveals to us that you're supposed to code that as, oh, he been had a mob mentality. He been had a gang mentality. He He's, he's always wanted to jump on people. So, of course, it makes sense that he jumped on Orlando Anderson. Exactly. Even though even though people like Corrupt and MCA say that they've seen Pac in L.A. clubs getting it on, squabbling with dudes who had issues with him. They've also seen him get jewelry back for rappers who got jacked in L.A. Like Met the Man and Wu-Tang, they got jacked. For some of they, their chains, they found the dudes who did it, asked them to kindly give give it back. There's even a rumor that Pac paid the dude the equivalent amount just to make peace with the East Coast. And they don't tell you that around this time when these East Coast rappers are coming to the West, Pac is putting together an outfit known as One Nation, where he's trying to get rappers from all over the so-called United States to join in the fold from boot camp clip. He was trying to get an outcast. Him and Nas met up in um, New York City at a, at a park to squash their beef. Pac, Pac was like, yo, well, you got an issue with me, bro? And he's like, yo, matter of fact, Nas, Nas said to him, he was like, yo, man, dude, I love you, bro. I don't want no issues. But I'm hearing that you dissing me behind the scenes and you got all these tapes. And he's like, bro, I don't got an issue unless you got an issue. Because on the, the message from It Was Written, it's a Nas album, he was talking about fake love. I mean, fake thug, no, no, no love. And he thought he was dissing him. 
Pac was listening, to, it was written all the way to Vegas because he was thinking, yo, how am I going to respond to this dude? Because he respected Nas's pen. But when they met up at the VMAs, I mean, the MTV of Music Awards, they squashed it. And he said, yo, come to Vegas in a week. I'm, I'm going to be shooting the Street Dreams video for It Was Written. You're going to be out there. Let's get together. And Pac was super juiced up, super excited. He was telling his people, he was like, yo, I want to do an album with Nas. This is all facts. But they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that, oh, One Nation was an entire, like, you know, disavowal yeah. of the way East, East Coast, West Coast beat. These are crucial. Like, why is, why is that not mentioned? Why is that not mentioned? They don't want that information. That one of his last creative endeavors. They mentioned every other creative endeavor above the rim. Uh, what was the shit where he was, uh, was like with the, uh, fuck. Grid locked, grid locked. Poetic, they mentioned all these things. Poetic justice. They mentioned all these albums. Oh, he out. They don't mention One Nation. Why? Because they want you to have a, a a very reduced understanding of who Tupac Shakur is to fit the narrative yeah. of the young nigga who can't control himself, the young assaulter, the fake gangbanger, bro. The nigga grew up in projects. What is fake about that? Marin City. <laughs> projects across the country. Like not just in Marie, Baltimore, New York. The nigga was broke. No, because niggas are he, he grew up in Marine. Like, nigga, what you talking about, nigga? Like, come on. But he faking. You on the phone with one of the mm -hmm. most notorious mm -hmm. game beggars of all time and saying you can saying, like, now nah, you've like, yeah, you got introduced to this side, this form of game banging late. The some way I got introduced to the movement late, but we authentic on both sides of it. You got something, you can Shakur saying, hey, be careful, bro, because I don't want to have to come mm -hmm. out there and take care of you myself. I don't want to like make sure you keep good mm -hmm. people around you, because if not, then I'm going to come Ooh. out there. <laughs> what? I mean, that's why we got to look at the state. Absolutely. The Absolutely. State not only assassinated him, but they still fear him in his death. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, that, again, is the strength of Pac being a martyr, because mm -hmm. they fear, they fear Pac even in his martyrdom. His spirit is so strong to this day, and his spirit resonates with so much of the new African nation that they still have to kill his character, even in death, which just shows you the power that Pac had. There's which been no truth. The action he was taking, which shows you exactly what he was standing on day in and day out. And if people really uncover the truth about Pac, you know what I'm saying? What are they going to do? They're going to be inspired to live like Pac was. So they're going to take what Pac was doing about, okay, how, how do we stretch it to our situation Without right now? Question. How do we, you feel me, pick up that torch that Pac left off? You feel me? In 2023, if, if the masses of rappers actually had a good understanding of Pac, come on, bro. Come on. We already know what will happen. <laughs> this is why they have to assassinate him. This mm -hmm. character is still assassinated to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every day, there's a new video of Snoop Dogg or other dudes talking about, you know what I mean? Pac was, you know, he was getting a little misguided and he was juicing up the whole East Coast, West Coast beef. It's like Snoop, you literally dissed New York in one of your songs, New York, New York. You were knocking over the Empire State Building in the video. Like, you know what I mean? And like the fact that Biggie, Biggie was on Hot 97 and said, oh, y'all gonna let the dog pound and Snoop Dogg just come to Brooklyn and do this? And then they shot your trailer up. But you want to act like it was just Pac who was acting out. It was like, no, bro, you were inciting some things as well. So every, and I don't know if that's due to the fact that Snoop is always high. He don't remember what's going on. But every time he talk about Pac, he always tries to. He always throw him under like the bus. Throw him under the bus. All these, all these channels. Always. All these, like, YouTube channels are popping up now to get people's, like, take on, oh, yeah, Pac was in the bloods. Pac was claiming blood. You know, he put M.O.B. on his, like, he tatted, he tatted M.O.B. on him. And it's like, y'all don't understand how that pays credence to the fact of Pac was trying to find a tribe to ride with him. He needed to politicize a gang. He needed to politicize. And my personal conjecture, this is where conjecture comes in, where if we take the testimony of QD3, of Quincy Jones III, who was in those Machiavelli sessions, who was talking to Pac, and he was like, yo, now that I got the people paying attention to me, I want to give them some of, the some of the lessons that my mother told me when I was young. What are those lead lessons? Those are lessons of Panthers. Those are lessons of new African independence movement. So for him to say this in the Machiavelli sessions, the last music that he was recording, and then for him to you know be around these members of the uh, Ma Pai Rouge, to me, it only gives credence to the fact that he was trying to find 
in my opinion, an army to add on to the outlaws who were also his family. No one talks about how the outlaws were his family. He, they were family members, cousins, first cousins, and second cousins, Napoleon, all of them were family, friends, and family blood. So people don't understand he was trying to mold that street, that lumping mentality, that lumping organization with actual revolutionary organization. And I feel as though, as QD3 says, as Quincy Jones III said, he felt like Pac had to dumb down, quote unquote, to get to a core audience of people and speak to the heart, and he was going to take them somewhere else. And I feel as though that we see a renaissance within hip hop has been denied with the assassination of Tupac Shakur because it is only until after his death do we see just unrepentant, unabashed, um, you know, spectacles of wealth and greed and gluttony and hypersexualization and hyper, you know what I'm saying, violence, where no one's saying that Pac did not speak about violence, but there's a difference to report on violence. There's a difference to, you know, display violence within your lyrics. And then there's also the praising of violence. There's the spectacle of violence. There's the sensationalism of violence. And I feel as though that's where the minstrel uh, economy that we are in now, known as this hip hop culture, has taken us to in terms of the mainstream. You can always find traditionalists within the undergrounds and within the, you know, more outlaw cultures, which is why also Pac was a threat too. He was telling us to be outlaws. If you look at everything he was trying to preach to us, thug life, the hey you give little infants fucks everybody, outlaws, the outlaw culture of we don't need their institutions. Let's do it ourselves. We don't we don't need their 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 banks. Let's get the money ourselves. We don't need their food. Let's let's feed ourselves. That that outlaw culture that was being established and bridging the gap from the lump into the revolutionary organ organization, it was potent. And as John Patash talks about in the book, FBI War on Tupac Shakur, that cuts into the profits of drug trafficking when you turn street lumping, street uh, tribes, when you turn them away from the self-annihilation and the drug dealing, when you turn them away from that and you turn them into revolutionaries, now the drug trade is done in certain areas. Now how are these capitalists going to keep their front companies open if they don't use us as the stocks and bonds to lock up in the system and get more money for us how how are they going to fund their front companies to boost their fortune 500 company because that's all that america is ain't nothing but ghettos and concentration camps mixed in with front companies for these in, intelligence backed uh corporations and that's where we're at now and i feel as though Pac represented a person who had so much real estate within the minds of our people that if you take away that example if you take away the the ability to participate in that example and you only give them, you know what I'm saying, champagne and, you know, dollars and, you know what I'm saying, G-strings and marijuana and, you know what I'm saying, Patex and Audemars and diamonds. When you just give people the shiny things, you just give them sugar but no new nutrients, you, you get sick. And that's what hip-hop is. It's all sugar. It's all icing. And it tastes good for a second. But when you really peel back now, in my personal opinion, this is all just my conjecture, when, when you peel it back, I mean, look what it's—it's it's a lot of. Poison I mean, look what it does to our that's being to, given to, to our people to the young people, bro. Like I seen a video the other day, like Kodak, somebody sent it to me. Like, bro, it's clearly like having maybe an episode, or it might have been response to like some drug shit. Y'all seen that? No. Nah. It's evil, man. But like, yeah. look at what it look at yeah. what it does to him. It it chews you yeah. up and spits you out. On average, even the niggas who was getting money, it chews you up and spits, spits you, you out. out. It's like a level of poisoning but it's the psychological operation to get you to poison yourself so or it gets you to poison your other people you feel me till nice you eventually point. become a a fucking jay-z yeah. where you making billions and billions and billions of dollars like at the expense of who at the expense of who the new african nation yeah and yourself <laughs> but on average man like what, it, what it's doing to to the average uh person who was out here making the that music, that drill music, that music that's pushing uh, drugs and alcohol, that shit is leading niggas to being dead or in jail on average. On average, bro, you got a lot of people that's that's dying, uh, that's rotting in prison over this music that are, that they making. Uh, it's, it's that's why it's so easy to constantly push the minstrel hyper violent shit. 
they're gonna push it all the time. They're gonna they're gonna push it. It's gonna sell. It's it's a twofold. They're gonna kill the niggas. It's gonna contribute to genocide, whether that's by death or going to jail. And we're gonna make money off of it. Who cut the checks? That's the shit we gotta ask ourselves. <laughs> It's all for love, man. I mean, it's all by design, especially if you know MK for Ultra <laughs> and the design of all this and the, the, the repetition. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, you listen to certain music all day, you're going to feel a certain type of way. Mm-hmm. It took me, like, taking, like, during Ramadan, not really listening to music. Like, I mean, I got to be a little more intentional with what I'm putting in my ears day in and day out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what I'm putting in my spirit, you know, because it's like, damn. I you just driving hella fast. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, cause I'm listening to the music. I'm just speeding. I'm like, man, you know what I'm saying? Bro, I'm listening to this young boy the other day and I'm like, I'm riding, I'm listening to it. But this nigga says, You ever have a nigga beat your mama now that you older, it's time to kill him or put your dirty clothes in a pillowcase? Like, this is like his bars. And I'm riding, I'm listening to this. I'm like, bro, but like, this is somebody reality. And we know why, we know what produced this reality colonialism, mm-hmm. imperialism. Got a nigga making millions off of him telling his story though. He's like, bro, have you come on? I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. That's why I say, that's a, that's why I say, brother, that like hip hop culture is a misnomer when really what we're talking about with the, within the mainstream context. I always say that hip hop culture is really a subsidiary menstrual economy of European corporations, where they allow the colonized subjects to meet gatekeepers, win the favor of the gatekeepers who have been appointed by these corporations. And through this menstrual economy, if you sell death, if you sell drugs, if you sell hypersexualization, if you sell reactionary behavior destructive to the community, if you sell that enough, if you have enough of a market share doing that, then you can become a star. Then you can become a bigger, you know, artist. Then you can get all these millions. Then you have your lifestyle funded by you being connected to the feeding tube of a Zionist or some Japanese billionaire or some French billionaire. Why do (laughs) I say like this, if hip hop is a culture, why aren't there as many kill the pig records as there are shake your ass records? Why isn't there if like, if, if, if rip me out the plastic is like going crazy and I'm not even shitting on people who dance to that because I do think that there's still some level of, tactician uh, of uh, tactics that we can use to turn uh, I'm in my opinion reactionary organized you know cultural events like going to the club and spending money on their alcohol and doing these things we can still turn these people turn our people uh, away from this reaction organization to saying you know what if we're going to listen to this music can we at least like pull some so like we can have a community carpool fund for the folk who are trying to get to the club and maybe that'll spur something more where, yo, maybe we, maybe we don't need to drink, but maybe we can just come here and dance again. Maybe, yo, everybody, leave the guns at home. Maybe we can get to that. And then Matt says, you know, let's transcend out the club and let's take this type of mentality into our neighborhoods where why don't we have carpool for the neighborhood? Why don't we leave our guns at home from this time to this time? Why don't we do this before and after school event for our kids? But that's where you have actual culture because you have the ability to democratically come up with ways to survive, to make sense of your reality. And there's no way for us to do that if we're on stolen land, if we're a stolen people, if our time is being stolen, if our labor is being stolen, if our labor means nothing. We can't be victims of perpetual theft and then claim sovereignty. We can only claim we want sovereignty as stolen people and all these things are being stolen from us. And that's where culture has to be made. So when people think that I'm being anti-black or anti, you know, new African, I'm not when I say that hip hop culture is not a thing. I think it's a misnomer that we use to talk about our regional traditions and how we use the African superstructure to use our traditions to respond to our condition. And that's where we are. We're, we're using our traditions that we have within our cultural memory and our cultural DNA as a to nigga who has to the domination that we're produced. Under. Nearly 20 albums, EPs, has had artists sign deals for nearly close to a million dollars. I can tell you right now that the culture that we are perpetuating is a culture that is ran and orchestrated 
by the capitalist. Period. We don't have no power in that industry. None. We have zero power, bro. Zero whatsoever. You go to, they just had BET weekend. Go look at who's really running these labels, bro. At the BET, at the BET weekend. Go look who really Bye, running Tom. these labels. <laughs> what, they gonna put Tyler Perry in Go look who really, where YouTube get their money from. Where Spotify get their money from. Where Apple get their money from. TikTok. Go look who really make the money. Who really get in the concentration of it. Yeah, we get these millionaires that sprout up every, but who, where's the concert, where's the money concentrated? It's not with it's not with new Africans. It's not with black folks. Black we get in crumbs, African. and that's how they get us. Superstructure. If the crumb is two million, that's better than you know that that make you feel like you're doing something. But this person's still exploiting you. You got two million. He got two hundred. Two hundred billion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could tell you. I mean, it's sharecropping at the end of the day. It's sharecropping because you know, the field up. you don't own the land, but you somebody don't own the land, who's you don't own the platform. Your labor. You don't own the microphone. <laughs> you don't own the laptop. We clearly don't want to live like this, but yet we're forced to. I I can guarantee you, young boy, don't want to have to make songs about niggas beating his mama. The niggas I the niggas I, I work with, they don't want to live like this no more. But it's what shit. This is what's accepted. This is the only way I can make a bag. This is what they want to hear because they've conditioned us to want to hear this shit. That's to want to live this way. Revolutionary organizing. Come on. That's why we got to build the cadre. You feel me? And build a material force to be able to challenge us to offer a different way. Like That's why I like, I like what you said. Man. I'm going to blame the cadre. And blame ourselves. Take a certain personal responsibility for the condition of ourselves and the condition of our people. Anyone that's claiming the consciousness, you got to, it's your own song, you don't. We have to say, all yeah. right, now we got to do better. <laughs> we got to build, we got to organize. And of course, we up against the state, up against neocolonialism, but we have to be able to shoot for lack of better words manifest our own destiny as a new african nation <laughs> we have to be able to create the world that we want to live in we have to be able to uh, uh move the nation in the way we want to move the nation we got to move you know this this physical world in a way that's beneficial to the masses of our people that's communal that's egalitarian and we only do that by building a cadre we only change and you know q talk about culture we only develop culture through revolutionary organizing through the through the power actually being in the hands of the people. Mm-hmm. For the people being able to control all these instruments that they use in day in and day out to benefit not only they self, but they brother, they sister, they sibling, mm-hmm. they family, they cousins, and the rest of the people. So ultimately, <laughs> that's why we got to free the land. All right, bro. So something you've uh, hipped us to a few times is the Nkrumah Shakur's framework. Can you uh, elaborate on that for the listeners for us and why yeah. you think it's uh, pivotal for what we're trying to do? Absolutely. Um, in terms of the fully fleshed out specifics, I'm still formulating an actual pamphlet, something that's going to be like pretty quick and easy, the same way like Code of Thug Life is. But it's just my, it's my uh, concoction that I've been planning on for probably about three years now. Because when I first started to delve into the the politics of Kwame Nkrumah and the politics and the legacy of Tupac Shakur, respectively, I saw a lot of symmetry. I saw a lot of um, alignment in how they would think about the world, in my personal opinion. And even from the lyrics to Nkrumah's speeches to things like class struggle in Africa, uh, neocolonialism, last stage of imperialism, to albums like Machiavelli and Tupacalypse Now and the interviews do with Sway and the interviews with Angie Martinez and the last interview that he did. I don't remember the gentleman he did it with, but um, I saw a lot of symmetry and first point of symmetry is one nation. We need one nation, both Pac and Kwame Nkrumah understood we need one nation. If we don't have one nation, we don't have cooperation. We don't have community without one nation. We can build micro communities, but in terms of us being an international community entity, no, we don't have that yet as new African people. And honestly, I would argue that as African people, we don't have that still, even after the the faux independence period or more so the toppled independence period, I would like to say. So we need one nation. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, most people understand to be the godfather of revolutionary pan-Africanism arguing that we need one army, one one currency, one state, 
and then we can still respect our sovereignties of within culture and within uh, ethnicity, quote unquote, um, and still can cohere around this, you know, one politic to rock on the same uh, accord that we need one nation within this cultural framework of hip hop. We need the, the South, the so-called South, the so-called Midwest, the West, and the so-called Northeast. To, you know, and I would take it to a different articulation of the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest, the Midwest, the South, and the Northeast. To me, these are the nations waiting to be made by new African people. These are the regions that new African people need to clarify ourselves within. We need to close ranks in these regions to then understand what we need. The West Coast, what they need in Oakland is not going to be everything that they need in L.A. Then the way that it looks is what I'm more so saying. The articulation of how we express our, you know, survival, how we actually articulate our survival through program work is not going to look the same. So what someone needs in Atlanta, Georgia is not going to be what they need in, in Louisiana. They have different climate. So they have different colloquial un understandings. They have different folklore. The Gullah Geechee peoples don't need the same thing as folk in Bronx, New York City. They need the same physiological needs met, but how that's expressed through program work is going to look formatted to their region, formatted to their locale. So we're talking about all these little microcosms that need to clarify. So if we're talking about just one state like California, Oakland, LA, San Diego, these are just three hub cities that already within themselves need to clarify neighborhoods for what, what, what do we need? And those neighborhoods cooperate with, with each other. Then from the neighborhood, you become an actual city itself. Then you become a representative nation of California. Then all the nations that come together and say, what have you been doing in your nation? What have you been doing in your nation? All right, it's time to click up. Now we're the West African Bloc. Now we're the new African Bloc here. Now we're new African Bloc in the Northwest. This goes all across the so-called United States. And I think that's how we have to do it. So one nation. Capital. Capital predates capitalism. That's one thing that we are struggling with still in our cadres within our organization is that we think that commerce and money and mercantilism, trade is an icky word because we see Jeff Bezos, we see these capitalists organize labor to reap from them. And the hierarchy is we get all of the labor and all the money that's produced by this labor, all your surplus value, we take it and we live our lifestyles at the behest of the ecology, at the behest of humanity. Whereas as African peoples, as folks who understand the transition stage from a mixed economy to a socialist economy to a communist world, you have to have capital. And you have to use capital to liberate parts of yourself and to organize institutions that you can't do just with ideas and bodies. You need physical raw materials. You need iron ore, you need oil, you need lead piping. These are things you can't just say, all right, y'all, we can get this from reading a book in a circle. No, that's gonna make us understand we have to have an ideology around how we use it, is, is the reading part, is the cadre part. But ultimately, how do we trade internationally with people if we don't have a landmass that represents ourselves? No one has to respect us on an international stage if we don't have land that represents and actually produces tangibles and capital. Capital is not just um, money. Capital is, I have 50,000 fields uh, across the United States that produce apples. Now I can trade apples to this country and get money from it to buy the bridges I need so that grandmas don't have to walk in the mud to get to work or I, you know I me, mean? these are just the ways in which we have to understand capital that sometimes we have to acquire and use the things that are disposal and produce and be producers to get the money that we need or the other tangibles that we need by trade. And that only comes from one nation. So Pac understood this and Nkrumah un, un, understood this. And Nkrumah says it in Class Struggle in Africa that we need to use the mixed economy to transition towards where we have private industry and public industry that is responsive to the needs of the people. And we use that to build our base of capital and our economic base to build power and respect on the international stage. Pac understood this as well when he's like, hip hop needs to be about more money, needs to be about the community, needs to be about us getting our dollars up, getting our papers up and actually building physical community centers so people can get their needs met. If you want a hot meal, 
if you want a bed, if you want a job, can I give you a job? That's capital as well. We have this many positions to, 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 to fill and we can pay people 15 bucks an hour, 20 bucks an hour, and you're going to live in our community and we make it for ourselves. So that's one, you know, fat facet. So physical institutions, we're talking about code of identification. Pac understood himself as a new African. You know what I'm saying? Kwame Nkrumah understood himself as an African. If we don't understand ourselves as people stemming from the same superstructure, from the same cultural history, from the same cultural DNA, from the same cultural memory, then we've already lost. Because you can't go into battle wearing different uniforms against the people who are organized around one uniform. NATO is a pan-European object. It's a pan-European entity. That's what NATO is. They represent the interest of Europe. So when they bomb a pipeline, it's because they need to do what's best to keep control of for the West. It's a Western entity. We as African people have to be on the same understanding of identification because if everyone's wearing different jerseys, we think the scoreboard is the different too. When the fact is, is that there's only one scoreboard, Europe up 300 right now. You know what I'm saying? The people in the East right now, they're starting to fight back with this multipolarity, but that's because they understand identification. No matter where you are in the world, a Chinese man has an opinion on China because he understands his national identification, his duty. It doesn't matter if he's in LA, it don't matter if he's in Beijing. He has an opinion about Xi Jinping. He knows who Xi Jinping is, by and large. So that's where we have to have the code of identification, our code of ethics, thug life, Kwame Nkrumah's code of ethics as well. We're talking about how to engage within uh, cadre. We have to have code of ethics. We have to know how to deal with each other, how to resolve conflict, how to resolve things like betrayal, how to how to how to, how to deal with that, you know, the actual everyday, you know, dealings within our neighborhoods, everyday dealings within our party. There's a code of ethics. It has to be decorum. People think that hierarchy and decorum are these colonial things like you're policing people's uh, behaviors and whatnot. No, we're not policing our behaviors. We're having a baseline to where we know what is appropriate and what is not for producing positive action. And I feel as though that's what Code of Thug Life represents, and that's what Kwame Nkrumah's code represents as well. And the last tenet is to just organize, to organize all of these things to suit our locales so that we can feed our superstructure, feed our people, and feed our future. So I've had people take shots on other podcasts saying there's ain't, 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 ain't no such thing as an Nkrumah Shakurist or whatever. And that's cool because I'm not a person who's going to be accepted by everybody. Not everybody's going to accept everyone's calculations, formations, and hypothesis about the world. But one thing you damn sure won't disrespect is the fact that I have done the intellectual rigor to posit this as a legitimate idea. And you can't just dismiss these facts. You can't just dismiss my rigor. So as an Nkrumah chorus, I believe that the one nation uh, coherent ideology is the only way for us to go. And that's where the family of the Shakurs and Kwame Nkrumah represents so much. Pac is the cultural, spiritual arm of revolution where you have Asada as the, as the revolutionary in the field, taking the outlaw culture to its highest expression of actually going against the state, where you have Afeni, the legal side, the understanding of law, the understanding of how to use law. You have Matulu, the medicinal side, the acupuncture. You have Lumumba Shakur, the oration of it, the actual organization of the lumpen around it. And Pac has a little bit of all of these because clearly he's the child of the revolution. But the Shakur family to me is who I'm talking about when I say Nkrumah Shakur. Is, that is to me a template for how family and how community should function, all of us in one coherent body politic. So by you know in that in that long soliloquy i hope people got something from it but i will be producing an actual pdf on this very soon i'm just still studying still trying to find a way to articulate it best to our condition today i mean it's one that's rooted in historical and dialectical materialism understanding both the past uh the current terrain and trying to forge something that can actually unify uh the african masses on a social economic and political level i mean it sounds a lot like provenance especially when we talk yeah. about the new african nation and uh, organizing in different locales and having forces wherever we are to ultimately have the same objective of freeing the land. And understanding it can't happen in Republic of New Africa. without a national identity. You are New A African. political identity. Without these things, it's what Pac says, poppycock. It's nonsense. 
<laughs> period. Without having a unified, at first, like Jaleel was at a, both Jaleel and Abbas were at, I can't remember the exact name of the conference, but put on by community movement builders out in Atlanta doing really great work. And one of Jaleel's questions was like, "I raise your hand if you identify as New African. Of course, he's talking to uh, not only the panelists, but the people in the room. Yeah, movie. the people there, right? Uh, and he asked this question that's to understand like, yo, both your political and national identity will start to govern every aspect of your life. What you identify as, that lays the foundation for your social, economic, and political interests. And first and foremost, we got to identify as African, new African for us uh, here in the so-called United States and understanding what um, our colonial subjugation has meant, whether it's been forcing, forcing them, forced to mix amongst each other as different African tribes or forced to, to mix amongst the colonizers, uh, recognizing that we can't point to, I don't know where I'm from on the continent, period. I don't know. I don't know. But I can trace to uh, the land of Port Arthur. I can trace to Murrow, Mississippi. I can trace back to them plantations and my people that fought there, right? And understanding that we have had a specific form of subjugation and exploitation being here in the belly of the beast as Africans here in America. And with that, we are going to have to wage a specific war here. And that, to me, it made complete and total sense. I just don't see how, again, your shit seems very stooped in history, very stooped in the current terrain, and has a, a hypothesis for what can get us to a liberated and sovereign. I mean, and it's the, the dialectical unity between the new African nation and Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism can't be established without, without the new African nation. No. The new African nation will always be on an island without Pan-Africanism. That's what it is. If we want the world to be free, new Africans got to be free. If we understand the United States of America as the primary source of evil, imperialism, and capitalism in the world, we got to ask ourselves, how do we best fight <laughs> the United States of America with all its tentacles? I'm saying if the head of it is right here in the land we're using, we have to have a national strategy for us to be able to end imperialism. You can cut off a tentacle and take off, you know, four AFRICOM bases. But what are they going to do? They're going to put that tentacle somewhere else within the continent or somewhere else within West Asia and develop another military apparatus. But if we go for the head, <laughs> like George said, we go to, for the head, we could we could save humanity and prevent nuclear warfare. I'm curious as to why someone would say you can't be a Shakurist. When you look at what that family has done to uh, organize the masses of people and, and combat uh, international finance capital, <laughs> why, why, why would someone say you can't be a Shakur? Because people are, in, in my estimation, people are too busy trying to make monuments to failure as opposed to engaging with contemporary understandings of who we are. And people can tell you everything about the 60s, they can tell you everything about you know, what happened in the 70s. They can tell you all about these movements that were toppled. But me and you come from an athletic background. You don't teach somebody how to play cornerback. You don't teach somebody how to play point guard by showing them old 1950s Bob Cousy highlights. This is not to disrespect the the foundation of, like, what, what, what Wilt Chamberlain means to basketball players today. But if you want a modern big man, if you want a modern football player, you're going to show them something that's a contemporary example, something that is somebody who's used similar technologies and had to deal with similar conditions to get outcomes that you desire. And then that's my issue with so much of quote unquote left organizing is people are caught up in making monuments to failure, monuments to things that people, if they were able to have lived past certain ages, those of our martyrs, they would tell you, why are you still listening to what I said in the sixties? Why are you still listening to to live exactly by this example? What I said when I didn't have to combat Google, I didn't have to combat facial rec recognition technology. I didn't have to combat, you know, drones that can see through 30 different types of surfacing and, uh, you know, from steel to iron. I didn't have to deal with robot drones that can go up in a building and take out an active shooter in Dallas. I didn't have to go up against BlackRock that has all of these technologies. It's not to say that our revolutionaries and martyrs of the past don't have valuable lessons that we need to adapt to our condition, but people don't want to do that yeah. part. Adapt the condition. I mean, ad adapt the expression of how we you know, deal with the condition. 
yes, it's still colonialism, neocolonialism, slavery, and imperialism, of, of course. But every technology, which is what these things are, every technology and every organizing force has mutations through time because capital has to react to the ecology. We're still natural beings. We're still organic matter. We're not immutable. We're not, you know what I'm saying, infallible. As, as human beings, we are a part of our nature. Imperialism and Western ideology wants you to believe that you are above nature. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can pick any point in time and just think that you're going to use the exact same tactics and get free with them. That's why I say you have to adapt to your contemporary examples. And that goes back to the first point I, that, we, that we talked about where Tupac is the last you know, living testimony that we have to the Black Power movement in contemporary American media, in hip hop, in film, all these things. He's the last through line that we have. It's not to lionize and romanticize people who made mistakes. It's to say, look at the mistakes of the last example. That baton has been dropped and we refuse to pick it up and deal with new examples, make new contemporary expressions, new contemporary disciplines for how we should live our lives and struggle. And I feel like that's the biggest issue I see is all these historians who want to make, they want to make, if I, if, if I could use this word, they really want to just use like a museum curator's eye to talk about left history. It's like, look at these, you know, objects from time and they'll pick them up and we'll exhume the bodies of Malcolm. We'll exhume the bodies of Fred Hampton. And we'll say, look at how beautiful they struggled and died for us. But no one wants to think, what would Malcolm do in 23? What would he be saying? Right how now? would that, or what program would exactly, he do? How, how would he conceptualize exactly. the new African independence movement? How would he talk about Pan-Africanism? How would he address BRICS? How would he address what's going on right now in every new African locale? Because he would have analysis. I mean, we we talk about what we read, you know what I'm saying? Or, or reading our old writings, like, hey, man, I cringe a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I would change it, change it. That. Like, Pac would probably make some changes, too. Malcolm makes some changes. They're human beings. <laughs> They're not, they don't defy the laws of nature. You know what I'm saying? And one of the laws is either you, you either go backwards or you go forwards. You either in decay. <laughs> like, it's just, that's what, that's what happens. People's thoughts advance. And this is where Huey says most people try to, under the guise of, Huey says that most folks just get caught up in historical materialism, constantly looking at the looking at the past, analyzing the past, and applying that same whatever analysis they reach and applying it to the future. When that is not, that's just not how it's supposed to. That's not how science works. That's not scientific. That's not scientific at all. Scientific is making sense of the current terrain and, and trying to manipulate matter in the way that you want it in its current form in its current context. We say all the time. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah wasn't dealing with AFRICOM. He might have been dealing with the early seeds of it, but he wasn't dealing with it. AFRICOM did not exist. Yeah, niggas might have had to been dealing with the Kamina base, that big ass base in the Congo and all these different things, right? But they weren't dealing with AFRICOM. He wasn't dealing with drones. <laughs> he wasn't dealing with Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda as proxy for the Western powers to come in and, you know, misrepresent Islam to the whole world. And oh, it was just the rebels who took out Gaddafi. It was just the, you know, that's who they would do in Krumah like they did Gaddafi. They, they would do him like that in today's context. Cause I don't have to, I don't have to touch you. I'm gonna just get the CIA to pay some rebels who want to go into your country and install reactionary Islamic law. And now we're going to represent that as what Islam is to the whole world. Mm -hmm. And that's my issue with so much of, um, a lot of these people who have left the movement completely, they've people have chosen book deals, people have chosen just to be podcasters, people have chosen to only be, you know, cultural critics responding to reactionary celebrity news. And that's because they don't have the heart for it. They don't have the actual understanding that it was never gonna be your beautiful speech that freed niggas. It was never gonna be your beautiful poem or your amazing article or your great insight. It's not gonna be this. That, that frees us. It's just going to be the exchanging of ideas and how do we materialize them in real life in our locales. Yep. And that's the part that takes the everyday commitment and the work that I think Apoc or Nkrumah or Malcolm, the names that we're lifting up. Just think about like what, um, you know, 
just think about that uh, that entire uh, history. The reason why we're speaking about them now is because they materialized actual ideas and synthesized our reality for us. I mean, even we look at the Black Panther Party, like they took the ideas of Malcolm and put it into practice. That's what they did. <laughs> so we got to take what we've learned from the past and apply it to the current, understand the terrain. We got five minutes left. I want to end on y'all top five, either Pac songs or verses. Man, um, my number one favorite Tupac verse is probably The Struggle Continues. If you listen to that joint, um, yeah, no, he's, I was born as a rebel making trouble for the devil. Take this game bang shit to a whole nother level. Can you feel me now? Armies in every, Armies in city. every city. Definition of power. Definition players, of power. Are you players, are you with me? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, come on now. Like, we're not talking about nothing else. Uh, so that's number one. I'd probably say number two would be there's a um, staring staring through my rear view part two, which is uh, all formerly known as grab the mic, where you know he, he talks about like you know the young nation and whatnot. Uh, I would say hold your head is my third, just from Machiavelli. Just the shout outs to Sekou, Geronimo. Yeah, shout out to all his OGs, the real revolutionaries. I love that song. My fourth song probably would be. I'm going a, I'm to a stick with Machiavelli. I love to live and die in L.A. Just on, it's just a, like, this is my shit, personally, to live and die in L.A. Him talking about, like, black and black black love, brown pride in, in the sets again. I appreciate that. You know, intercommunalism. And then probably my fifth favorite joint, I would have to say it would be Give Me uh, Can't See Me. Can't see me is my joint off of all eyes on me. So I can get two, I'll give you three revolutionary joints and I'll give you uh two um, you know, just real nice party type joints. What about you, B? Against all odds. That just I don't know, it's just be getting me fired up. <laughs> Military minds, fame. Hail Mary, and just mm -hmm. just something about that beat, bro. It's a spirit. <laughs> it's a spirit. Still balling. Yeah, that's probably still balling. It's not a still balling ambitious no as a writer. No particular order with mine. Like my these all three make the list, but still balling, uh, troublesome. Yeah. And sh ambitions as a writer. So many tears. I'm getting money and the struggle continues. It's like we're gonna have to make a, a playlist from from after this. Uh... <laughs> Troublesome is so real talk. <laughs> Niggas talk a lot of shit, but that's after I'm gone because they fear me in the physical. He predicted like, all this shit. He predicted all this shit. Bro. He predicted it. Yeah, yeah, for so. sure. Uh, man, I appreciate you breaking bread with us. I know it's down there nine o'clock where you at. It's all good, brothers. Anytime my brothers call me, I'm I'm right there, bro. We got 